Here we go. So take it away, Jack. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, sorry about that intro, but uh, that my, my name's Jack. Uh, most folks call me Two Fish. That was in my first uh, fighter squadron. I was the second fisher. So does it, anybody know Dr. Seuss? Yeah. Yeah. And all right, one fish, two fish. I'm I'm two fish, red fish, blue fish. Um, so what I was gonna do is I'm gonna talk through a video that goes through uh my space mission. Um, and then there is a video of the company that I work at now, uh, where we are uh, building lunar landers to go back to the moon. And so uh, we can kind of watch those two little videos real quick. And um, there is, uh, and then we'll have more time uh, for any questions that you have. So does that sound good? And, and like Mrs. Burns said, uh, as we go through this, I'll just talk a bunch. Um, and you guys just enjoy the video and think of questions that you want to ask. And what I'll do is I'll try to start it. We'll make sure that it's not frozen or uh, I'm, I'm talking for 20 minutes with, uh, without you guys. Uh, be able to see anything. And uh, as long as we're good to go, then we'll just cruise through that and do the questions. All right. All right. Let's try to share this bad boy. Okay. Do you all see a, uh, a screen? Yes. Shared? All right. Yes. Let's see. Can you hear anything? Yes. And it's not frozen. <laughs> All right. Well, then I guess it's time to go. So I went to space with the Russians um, on a Soyuz FK rocket uh, launching out of Kazakhstan. Um, and the green part is where all the gas goes uh, to feed those engines. The white part is where we sit. And then there's a little shroud on top that can pull you away in case there's a, a problem. Uh, I, uh, they roll it out uh, horizontally and then they rotate it into position. It's got about two inches of clearance. It's the darndest thing, uh, but it works. And as they're getting the rocket ready, they're getting us ready with all sorts of weird training, like uh, trying to mess with our vestibular. We also do a lot of traditions. So this is uh, Red Square. Uh, this is Gary Gagarin's office um, in Star City where we sign a register. Um, we also sign a door of where we stay in quarantine uh, down in uh, Kazakhstan before we, before we launch. Um, we, uh, we also, you know, we have some blessings and we walk out to this Russian techno music. Uh, wave to everybody and then uh, get our spacesuit uh, space in a big room that's like a, a fishbowl. Uh, make sure that it's, it works. Uh, say hello to the press and, and uh, say goodbye to our family. Uh, and then we walk out and uh, ask the uh, head of Roscosmos if we can borrow his rocket. Uh, and we head out to the rocket. And remember how it was green before? Well, it's white now because it's got frost. So it uses uh, liquid oxygen and a, a thing called RP1. Uh, and even though it's cold, it makes fire plenty good. And in about eight and a half minutes, you're in space. We use this super technical thing. It's called a stuffed animal on a string. And that's how we know when we're in space because it's floating around. Hmm. But we also use some other stuff that's a little more complicated uh, to track the uh, space station and, and chase it down. Takes about uh, six and a half hours uh, for us. They actually do it a little faster now um, to find and uh, dock the uh, to the space station. And then we come in, and and it was my first time, so I'm a little upside down and sideways with an awkward hug. Um, Yoder, uh, my crewmate, this was his fifth ride, so he's perfect. Um, but then uh, my wife asked me what I thought of being in space, and uh, we'll see if we can hear what I said. But it's a uh... It's a burrito of awesomeness smothered in awesome sauce, baby. It's so beautiful. Yeah, that's a pretty technical term, but uh, it's accurate. Um, <laughs> right after I docked, uh, the Cygnus showed up uh, on orbit, uh, and we get all sorts of visiting vehicles. This one's pretty unique. 
in that it carries all this cargo up to us. But then when it uh, when we fill it back up, a lot of it's trash, but some of it is uh, science experiments because it can undock, go around for a couple of weeks, do uh, uh, investigations like this little thing that looks like a spaceship and then re-enter. And it's a, it's a great example of uh, teamwork. Let's see if I can, if we can hear what I said when we let it go. Uh, just to say a few words about OA-7 and the SS John Glenn. In uh, its release and the entire mission, it performed beautifully, a fitting testament to the legendary explorer and patriot whose name it bears. Performance is also a testament to the team that supported it throughout the mission. Every detail, from the flawless system operations to the perfectly labeled straps, to a well-orchestrated symphony of cargo and science logistics, we can't say enough about the team we have the privilege to represent here on orbit. I want to send our best wishes on the final phase of its mission. Godspeed and fair winds, SS John Glenn. It has been an honor. So the next day, uh, we had SpaceX 11 show up. Um, that was the first time there were only two uh, U.S. folks on the on the U.S. side. So it was me and Peggy on the U.S. side, Fyodor on the Russian side. Um, and the first time that we captured a vehicle, docked it, unloaded all the science, did all the science, put it back on the vehicle and puked it off in, uh, in 30 days. Wow. So it's just an example of how the, the team keeps getting better at doing science and they're even better today. Um, a, a couple months later, uh, we got a, another vehicle. Uh, this is when we had a full crew uh, called SpaceX 12. Um, and we had a lot of coffee that morning, so we were moving really fast. Just kidding. <laughs> but uh, but um, when a new vehicle docks, uh, you make sure that there's the pressurization is good between the vehicles. Open up the hatch, you take out all the equipment, then you put on some uh, some gear just in case there's any contamination inside the vehicle when you open the hatch. You open it up, and then it's it's a free for all. You uh, you want to unload all of the cargo because NASA is really smart and they put some ice cream at the bottom. So we want our ice cream. And uh, we work really hard to get that whole thing unloaded so we can have some. Um, we also, since Fyodor was the only guy on the Russian side, I was trained in all progress uh, vehicles. Um, and we had two of those come and go while we were uh, on the station. Uh, in total, we had about 25,000 pounds of cargo. And that's everything. That's your, uh, that's your food and your underwear and toothpaste but mostly it's science. It's all sorts of science experiments. And that's why the space station exists is so that we can learn new things uh, that will help us here on earth and help us uh, take further steps in the stars. Um, this is a, uh, a biophysics experiment and even cooler right next door to it is a combustion experiment where there's this thing called convection on Earth where hot air rises and it makes the flame uh, shape that you're used to, feeds oxygen into the flame. Uh, on orbit, it actually burns outward. It burns all that oxygen up and then puts itself out. Uh, so it's a, it's a unique uh, and, and it, it helps us understand how to be more efficient both in orbit and on Earth. Um, this one was super cool. We levitated these little balls of metal, shot them with a laser beam. And for the same reason, there's no convection. When it solidifies, it does so uniformly. So it can make uh, uh, materials that are stronger and lighter than anything we can make here on Earth. Um, lyophilization is just a fun word. Uh, it is using the vacuum of space to basically freeze dry different medicines um, that we can use as a technique for long term storage as we go uh, to the Mars to Mars and beyond. Um, this is a, a glove box and my buddy Peggy uh, that keeps us safe from the experiments, but also the experiments safe from us. Um, these little guys, we got robots everywhere. Uh, these were programmed by middle school students uh, around the world to do different logic tests. And then uh, uh, it was an international competition. Um, this was a neat experiment uh, where we flowed. Uh, once you get the pump, pump primed, 
It had no moving parts and it would go across a uh, sorbent bed and pull CO2 out of the air. Uh, this was one of my favorites as a cancer dad. Um, this was, I called the cancer seeking missile. It was a, uh, it would go after lung tissue, cancerous lung tissue, leave the healthy tissue alone. So it was like a smart weapon for uh, 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 cancer. Um, as I said, there were robots everywhere. This little guy was a Japanese robot. Uh, so of course I had to bow to him. Um, and I didn't want those eyes turning red and him getting mad at me. So you gotta, you gotta be nice to the robot. Um, in the Japanese segment, there's also an airlock where you can put um, things on a slide tray, slide them outside, grab them with a robotic arm and do things with them. This uh, particular uh, item was a small sat or a cube sat launcher. So over a couple weeks, we, we uh, launched a couple dozen uh, cube sats off of this device uh, that Nanorax makes. Um, and it's a really good way to get low cost access to space, uh, especially for schools. Um, lots of experiments from schools on the station. Uh, this is plant growth. Um, this was my old school in Colorado called Centaurus. Uh, they actually had a, a, an experiment on orbit when I was up there. Um, we definitely want to understand plants, so different ways to grow them. Um, we can grow something like this in a little over a week by using creative and effective soils and lighting schemes. Um, this little guy, everything smaller up there, um, is uh, able to take a sample and uh, sequence the DNA and understand exactly what it is. Um, we have lots of stuff outside as well. Um, this is a roll up solar array, a ROSA, um, that we were testing. Um, and now those, uh, those very, uh, that very technology is used for our larger arrays on the space station. Um, we got to keep in shape and we got to keep our bones from getting brittle. So we do all sorts of working out about two hours a day. We have a uh, treadmill where we uh, use bungee cords to, to stay on the treadmill and have that impact. Um, we have a, a kind of like a super bow flex thing called the A-Red. Um, and you'll see that it's like scissors where it's got one point. So we're not imparting any loads on the fragile space station. Um, same thing, our bicycle is just a box with little clip-in uh, pedals, and then we float around on a, on a, a rack uh, so that we're not putting any of that uh, force into the uh, space station. And we're kind of, we're kind of lab rats, so all the astronauts, we want to make sure that all that working out is working, so that sausage casing looking thing is what we use to uh, make sure that each slice of muscle is doing what it's supposed to in bone. Um, we also, because the blood doesn't go to your feet, um, it tends to increase the pressure in your head. And uh, in doing so, it can squish the back of your eye and change your vision. And so we take a lot of care to understand what's happening to our eyeballs. Um, the good news is you don't have to use that blue goo. You can just put some water and it sticks to your face up there. And you can use that to uh, do your ultrasound when you're in orbit. Um, coolest thing I did up there was spacewalk. So I did a couple of spacewalks with my buddy Peggy. Um, the first one, uh, we went out and it was a heck of a, uh, a first step. Um, but once you get over that and just the amazing view, the, the space station is, is huge. And when you're out there, you can really appreciate it. That's half of the space station. And you can kind of see in the middle of the screen, little Peggy on uh, the uh, alpha magnetic spectrometer, which is uh, uh, one of the big payloads out there. A um, couple weeks later, we had to go outside because one of our critical pieces of equipment broke and we needed to fix it immediately. Um, so we went out there and while we were outside, uh, I went out and installed some antennas um, that are now being used for the SpaceX Dragon and the uh, soon to be uh, CST-100 from Boeing uh, to communicate with the space station. But the biggest part is, wow, what a view. 
And uh, I didn't, I wasn't very good at taking pictures before I went, but I had to learn um, because you really have to capture uh, the beauty that is out the window. Um, I grew up in Colorado, a big old Broncos fan, so I had to take a picture a mile high. Um, and we take pictures of, of things on the earth, uh, whether they're deserts or glaciers or uh, volcanoes, old or new. Um, we get scientific data from all of these pictures. Um, you know, I was up there for hurricanes. Uh, we were up there for the eclipse uh, that went across the United States. This was uh, 2017. Um, you know, you get to see uh, different types of sedimentation on beaches and erosion in, in different lakes, um, all of which are useful science information, uh, drainage, uh, uh, irrigation, uh, algae bloom. But it's also really pretty. I mean, that looks like a rainbow off the rainbow state, right? That's an algae bloom. The Red Sea. Um, it's the scientists are getting fantastic data, uh, but we're also getting a great view. Uh, this is the Bahamas, and it looks like somebody threw a neon light in the water. Um, it literally glows. Uh, and water is just amazing because you'll be flying over something, you'll see smooth glass, and then a few seconds later, uh, because of the reflection of the sun, you see the current. A few seconds after that, you get a pure reflection that makes it um, like a mirror. And if you have a low angle, it looks like it's on fire. And all of those give us information about the environment while also some beauty. Um, some pictures you take, though, I don't know that there's any scientific information you can get from it, but they sure do change it in person because it's just so pretty. Um, it takes seven seconds for the sun to go from nothing to a full orb uh, because we're going around the earth so fast. So if you're going to take a picture of a sunset or a sunrise, you got to be on your game. Uh, and it is worth it. The layers and the colors and just the beauty are, are so amazing. Um, and I didn't doctor that. The earth is round, so don't ask me that question later. Um, I love taking pictures of the uh, space station uh, with the Earth um, as just a testament to what we can do when we work together. Um, and even things that you've seen before just, just look different. Um, that different perspective of being um, in space and, and, and nighttime was my favorite um, because it was so foreign. Um, this was actually SpaceX 11 coming back in. But when you fly over at night, it's you, the lightning is like a heartbeat of the earth. There's no borders. It's just a, a beautiful, beautiful place that we all live and share. Um, and if you're lucky enough to see uh, the, uh, the aurora, um, it dances in greens and purples and whites. And uh, it's, it's fully alive. Um, if you look out the back end of the station and, and give yourself time to adjust, you can see more stars than you thought were possible. Um, and the disk of the Milky Way um, rotating as you go around the Earth. Obviously, you got to share this with the world. Um, so we did a 4K, the first 4K downlink uh, from space, and, and they asked me what my favorite movie was. So we'll see if we can get that. For me, it was definitely the right stuff as a as a test pilot who, you know, Edwards was my second home. You know, the start where there, he's like flying through the clouds and he's talking about there's a demon that lived on the fader. And then the plane crashes, it explodes, it goes to color. That's just so awesome. And then also space balls because we're basically flying at ludicrous speed right now. <laughs> There you go. And you got to have fun. For goodness sake, you're floating. That's That's got to be fun. Um, you got to, uh, you know, you got to do all the normal stuff. You got to cut your hair, only you need a vacuum to do it up in space. You got to clean your room on the weekend. So that's me and my Bronco pants on Saturday, cleaning the filters and floating around. You do have to poop and pee. So the buckets for pooping and, and the uh, hoses for peeing. 
Um, it's all about suction. You don't even have to ask me about that anymore. This is Friday nights watching movies. So we kind of float and, and get like little spiders in a web uh, watching the uh, movies on Friday. You got to play with kid toys because they're more fun in space. Definitely have to celebrate your favorite holidays. So this is 4th of July with me and Peggy. And I uh, married my wife again because it was our 20th anniversary. And no, my puppy wasn't in orbit, but I put him in the picture anyway. Um, your socks get trashed because of all the Velcro everywhere. So I uh, made homage to them. And, and this was a great event where all those triangles are painted by cancer kids around the world. We had nine different countries all calling in. Um, and it was a really special uh, uh, event with cancer kids. This is the best way to drink your coffee in floaty ball form. Um, and even though that looks disgusting, it, it tasted delicious because it was floating and that's pretty much all the food. Um, I, it, of course, had to take an entire packet of, of pudding and try to uh, jam that into my mouth. Um, I did not succeed, but I did not give up. So I went back after it. And I got it. <laughs> um, even if it's a boring quesadilla, if it's floating, it's cool. Um, you got to play with physics. Uh, and since my nickname's Two Fish, I had to go floating with the fishes until I ran into the wall. Boom. Um, you know, after about uh, five and a half months, it was time for the next crew to, to do their thing. So Peggy and, and Fyodor and I jumped in the, our uh, spaceship. Uh, closed up the hatch and, and headed home. Um, when you leave this station, uh, it's black outside, but then as you start going through the atmosphere, it's it's gray and then white and then red, and then it's on fire. And you see little pieces of the heat shield coming by your window um, until that kind of crusts over uh, and charred. And then your chute comes out, kind of shakes, shakes off that. You can look out the window and get ready for a not so soft landing. Boom. Yeah, we land in Kazakhstan. Um, it is not soft at all, and but it works, and it has for a while. So uh, the search and rescue forces were there within minutes of us landing. What they do is they uh, safe the vehicle. Um, they roll it so that it's easier to pull us out. Um, they safe the chute and all that. And then they, they, they drag you out of the, uh, the vehicle. And, and that's where we're strong enough because um, we did all that working out, but your, your vestibular, your inner ear is all whacked out. And instead of walking around like, you know, drunk, drunk folks, they, uh, they carry us, set us in the desert. We have a little press conference and we call home, say, honey, I'm home. Um, say hello to everybody and then get some more fluid uh, back in our, our system. Um, since you, you actually uh, don't need as much on orbit. And we do one more uh, tradition, which is uh, rocking a uh, purple Kazakh uh, robe and, and hat, and then uh, jump on the plane and come home. Um, I was on orbit with first a, a group of five, uh, long time, just the three of us, and then, and then a uh, group of six, but we were just the lucky few, uh, kind of the cherry on top of the Sunday of thousands of people the world over that uh, make space flight uh, happen. And it's a great reminder to all of us of what you can do when you, you work together as one team. Um, that's that video. Let me show you this other one is only about two minutes long. And Jack, I think, uh, Jack, I think it might be a good idea just to, if you don't mind, let's see if the kids have any questions because I'm I'm worried that it'll be too much if they don't get a chance now. Would that be okay? Well, why don't I show this one? It's two minutes. Okay. And then we're done. Okay. All right. So here we go. Um, boom. All right. You see it screen? Yes. Here we go. Control, go. Final, go. Guide, go. Control. This city of Houston, go. this state of Texas, this country of the United States was not built by those who waited and rested and wished to look behind them. At Intuitive Machines, we are mechanics. This generation does not intend 
the founder and the backwash of the coming age of space. We mean to be a part of it. We mean to lead it. Committed to President Kennedy's long dormant challenge. We set sail on this new sea because there is new knowledge to be gained and new rights to be won. And they must be won and used for the progress of all people. From how we build, test, and deliver our designs, we are redefining traditional aerospace. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. With three missions to the moon over the next two years, we have pushed innovation at every step creating in-house technology to solve intractable problems. From software to avionics, advanced manufacturing, guidance navigation and control, precision landing system, complete propulsion system, and more. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. Once assembled, this lander is directed from a state-of-the-art control room by a world-class team through an operational, worldwide lunar distance network. We look forward from our Houston home with hope. This is our home, a place we're surrounded by family and friends, the people of true grit. Whether it's a flood, a pandemic, or a challenge of going to the moon, Space City doesn't back down from a challenge. We've created a family of spacecraft and collection of technology that can write our shared future. Daring greatly. We know it will be a good flight. In the arena to conquer the unknown. Boom. All right. Now we can bring everybody up and answer any questions you guys have. All right. Uh, Viraj, I see your hand up. What's up? Uh, what, what, what would you do if something went wrong and you don't have the supplies to fix it? You know, um, figure out how to make what you do have work. Um, we have on the space station a, uh, a, an interesting collection of stuff. Um, and uh, every time we try, we, we can usually fix it. We're we're lucky enough uh, with the space station that if it's something that we can't or don't have on the station now, um, we have a lot of, excuse me, a lot of vehicles that are coming to the space station that can give us more. Well, let's see. Uh, Wyatt, how about you? How did you win the White Star Bobcat radio? How I did you? <laughs> Well, it was a long time ago. I was uh, 18, which was a few years ago. Um, I had I had grown up uh, working for my dad uh, in construction, and and back then there's this thing called OSHA. Well, it wasn't didn't really exist back then, so uh, a six year old could drive a bobcat. Now you got to be 18 uh, to legally uh, drive a bobcat, and uh, I got a lot of hours on it, and. Uh, and and when I did turn 18 and became legal, uh, I went into the Bobcat Rodeo and uh, was able to win. So that was a while ago. Um, Delaney, how about you? What was your favorite experience as an astronaut? Um, I would say, you know, uh, my my daughter um had cancer and uh, uh so she was part if you remember in the video that suit that was all those triangles um that was that was a real special moment because we had kids from all over the world uh that were calling in on cancer kids and astronauts and in nine different countries um that were a part of it it was just a really cool experience to kind of come together and 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 have a special moment for uh, for cancer kids. Um, let's see, who do we got? Arav. Um, yeah. Um, so, um, first, my dad is actually a cancer doctor. Cool. And then, um, uh, are you ever going to send people to Mars? We're sure working on it. Uh, a lot of what we're building, infrastructure-wise 
for the moon is all stuff that we can use uh, to go to the moon or to go to Mars. Um, two things we really need to work on is, is better engines that can get us there faster because right now it's about a six month trip um, and radiation shielding. So uh, we, we either need to get there faster or have better shielding or by the time folks get there, they're gonna be full of radiation, which is not so good. I think All right. Carl had her hand up next. Okay. Who, who's that? Uh, Carl? Car Coral? Um, what's your favorite view as an astronaut? Like when you're in space, what was your favorite view? Oh, man, it's when you're outside. It's like, you know, when you're in a, a pretty place and you look out the window and it's, it's great, uh, but when you step outside uh, and you're just surrounded by it, and nothing in between, you know, the vacuum of space, but a little, little visor, and and you just get to see with with the whole expanse of your vision, uh, just such beauty. It's it's when you're outside, and uh, probably the prettiest when I was out there was uh, when we were flying over the Bahamas, because man, those those uh, the blue, uh, it, like I said, it looks like somebody threw a light in the water, and it it just it's gorgeous. Let's see who else we got. Um, Kaya, how about you? What was the most fun thing you did on the International Space Station? Well, it was going outside because that's just super cool to do a spacewalk. Um, but I had a lot of fun. Um, maybe I had too much fun, uh, <laughs> but uh, you're floating all the time. So I would play with my food and you know, spin and flip, and it was just a, a heck of a lot of fun. Space is a blast. Let's mm -hmm. see, who else do we have? Um, uh, Sebastian, you have any questions? I'm trying to go around and get everybody. Nothing? All right. How about Rohan? Nothing? Doug? At Zeke? All right. How about Viraj? Uh, if you can't colonize Mars soon enough, will you be able to colonize uh, the moon faster? So we're going to we're going to build up an infrastructure on the moon, um, but the moon is never uh, it's not going to have tons of people because it's inhospitable, right? There's no atmosphere. There's there are resources, but not the type that we need to breathe and live. Um, Mars, on the other hand, um, there's a ton of water, uh, there's an atmosphere that we could conceivably make, uh, more robust and, and, uh, uh, more suitable to, to humans living. And a lot of people could live on Mars. So, um, Mars is, is more of an option than the moon. Uh, but we need to take that first step four days away instead of six months away, uh, mm -hmm. so that we can build up the technology we need. Okay. I think okay. Reese Reese had his hand up also. Okay. Reese, what you got? Um, is the path from the Air Force to NASA a good way to become an astronaut? You know, it, it used to be um, that pretty much every astronaut was a test pilot like I am. Um, but that's changing uh, because we, do, we still need that, that skill set of being able to quickly take control and, and understand a, a spacecraft that's only flown once and know the systems well enough to, to get it safely home or to your destination. Um, but you also need other stuff. So if you saw the Martian, um, that, that's a good example of a botanist, right? Or, or as he called himself, a space pirate. You need different skill sets. You need doctors, you need uh, folks that understand the environment, folks that understand plants. And, and so what you're seeing in like the last class of astronauts is a much broader uh, array of skills. And, and that's kind of the future. Um, you've also seen commercial astronauts and just the, how many more people are going to space um, last year and certainly this year, it's, it's changing. You don't just need to be a NASA astronaut to go into space. 
and um, uh, hopefully this year, uh, Starship will fly around the moon. Um, and that's eight people who have nothing to do with uh, being an, a professional astronaut, and we're going to see how they do. Um, <laughs> and Polaris Don, uh, Jared Isaacman, and, and his crew, um, he's not a professional astronaut, and he did pretty darn good, uh, him and his crew, on, on Inspiration4. And now they're going to go do a spacewalk. So it's really neat to see how more people um, with more diverse backgrounds are going into space and t helping humanity take those next steps. Pat, I'll just let you call uh, on everybody since you see sure. the videos. Sure. Um, okay. I know Kaya, you had your hand up. You'll be, and then Delaney, you're next, and then Wyatt. Oh, wait. Sorry, can I yeah. Sorry, I forgot my question. Can I come back later? Oh, you sure can. Sebastian? He's there. We have a few questions, sorry. So uh, what did uh, astronaut Fisher want to be when he was a kid? Did he always want to be an astronaut or something else? No, I did. I. Uh... When I was about six, I, I visited my grandpa who was working uh, here at Johnson Space Center and saw that big old Saturn V and just fell in love. Um, but uh, for me, it was always just being ready for opportunities because um, in that time frame, getting to be an astronaut was more luck than anything and, and timing. And uh, I was in the right place at the right time, but I was ready for opportunities and I just worked real hard. Um, I did want to be an astronaut, but, uh, I, I wanted to be a, a fighter pilot and, and a test pilot. And I got to do those things. And if that's all I ever did. That would have been fine by me. Um, but I was lucky enough to be in the right place at the right time and, and things worked out. So if you work hard and you're ready for opportunities, when they uh, come your way, um, you can dream as big as you want. Okay. That great question. Delaney. What was the hardest thing to do while you were weightless? Hmm. I'm going to, I'm going to go there guys. It's pooping. It's a tough <laughs> nut crack when you're floating. It is. Uh, and you saw that can, right? That hole, you, you spoiled little earthlings with your big old toilets with the big holes like this. Um, and, and you're floating around and the hole is like this and you got to figure out where you're, where you're, where you're aiming and, and you got to nail it. Uh, cause if you don't, that stuff goes floating everywhere and, uh, uh poop in your eyes is not a fun thing. Okay. <laughs> oh, Kaya, I know yeah. you asked to go Hard again. Thing. Kaya? Yeah, sorry. What aspects of the Artemis mission are you working on? Yeah, so we're building the infrastructure. So our our company is is uh, if you've ever heard the thing box then boots, um, we're the robots before the humans. So uh, we're building the technology of engines and tanks and landing systems. Um, we're putting uh, data relay satellites up. Uh, we've built a ground network of of communication dishes. So. We are kind of the infrastructure and the technologies that the humans will need uh, when when they get there. That's cool. Okay. Uh, Rohan and then Wyatt. Rohan, you had your hand up before. Sure. Okay, Wyatt. What was his favorite subject in school? Um, I liked a lot of subjects. Math was probably my favorite. Um, and then once I got to uh, college, uh, astrodynamics, uh, so space stuff. Um, I just like, I like systems and pretty much everything that, that uh, STEM is, I, I really like. I like science, I like physics, um, I like, the hard stuff that I think can make uh, humanity better and help us evolve. Kaya G. Uh, is there like, couldn't like liquid floating in balls like 
damage the spacecraft if it was floating in the wrong place? It sure could. Um, they, uh, there is a, <laughs> let me see if I can find a video for you. You'll, you'll dig this. Um, like I said, sometimes I had too much fun. Um, let's see. Where are you, baby? Uh, but yes, those, those, uh, um, those, gosh, where the heck would it be? Uh, and can you explain what she's asking? What? So, I... uh, water, um, due to surface tension, uh, basically just stays as a ball and you can make a pretty big ball. You can stick your head in the ball. It's, it's, uh, it's all sorts of fun. Um, but what it is, is because those balls are floating around, um, they can go into places where you don't want them to go. Um, and if they get in contact with uh, primarily uh, any sort of electrical, uh, that can be kind of bad. Um, oh, I know where it is. I forgot. It's on Dropbox. We have plenty of time, not to worry. Okay. Um, boom. And so keep going and I'll find this video okay. as we're talking. I think Sebastian had a second question and then I'm going to go back to uh, Kaya G. Sebastian? No? Uh, where did you sleep in space? Maybe we missed that, though. Uh, yes, ma'am. We, uh, we slept on a, uh, in a, in a sleeping bag. So you basically just tie it to the wall. Um, and, uh, when you do that, uh, you just hang there. So you don't even need a, a pillow or anything. It's, it's, uh, as an old fighter pilot with not the best back in the world. Um, I felt like I was 20 again, so I absolutely loved it. Great. All right. I got some pretty funny things I can show you guys real quick. Um, where uh, the first one gets back to the water question. And this kind of explains what happens. So let's take a look at this. And I made these. If you, if you look up speedy time on the internet, um, astronaut Jack Fisher speedy time, You'll see some of these videos and they're kind of fun. Uh, little little uh, pieces of equipment or uh, a phenomenology of, of being in space. And, and, they're, and I sped them up so I sound like a chipmunk and they're really short. You ready? Here we go. Today, we're going to look at one of the coolest parts of having experiments on the space station. It's because we can separate one of the most dominant forces gravity on a lot of different models. A great example is water. Water is pretty much dominated by gravity on Earth, but there's other forces at work that if we understand better, we can have a better model and make greater discoveries. Things like surface tension, capillary action. I'm gonna show you today by taking this wonderful bottle, repurposed from a condiment, and blowing into it. When I displace the fluid with air, it will come up the straw and cover my face. <laughs> Um, yeah and that was I, good i was cleaning that stuff up for a while um i'm gonna show you one more quick one that is where did it go and while he's getting it up in the chat i put uh what where you can find it on the internet uh, speedy time, Jack Fisher. All right. One more. This one's pretty quick, but it's a tour of the space station. So that answer is kind of like where you sleep. You ready? Here we go. Today, we're going to take a tour of the incredible place we get to call home, the International Space Station. We're starting in the JLP, which is one of our mini closets for stowage. And then we're coming in to the Japanese segment. We have lots of experiments. We have huge freezers that you've seen. Then we have a note 
where we can dock modules in three different directions. We have the European module called the Columbus. It has tons of scientific ex uh, equipment as well. This thing is called Mares. It's one of the biggest things on the station. All right, let's check out the United States laboratory. But first, we'll see where we sleep. This is node two. We watch our movies here and we sleep here. This is where I sleep. It's pretty messy, but at least there's a flag. That's cool. In here is the United States laboratory, the destiny. We have tons of equipment in here, not only scientific equipment to look at different uh, experiments, but also some of the systems that really keep the space station going. So that's pretty cool. We also, in here, have node one. We can dock more vehicles here at the uh, docking port on the bottom. It gets kind of confusing what's up and down. In here, we have the airlock. This is where we get into our spacesuits in this room, and then we go into this little room, and we close the door, we take all the air out, and we go outside and do spacewalks. Very cool. Over here, we have our treadmill, which you have seen before. Right here, we have our toilet, the super space toilet, or outhouse, as we lovingly call it. We have the A-Red, which you've seen before from Peggy's video. This is the PMM, where we store a ton of stuff. And then, of course, everyone's favorite, the cupola. If we come down here, you can see outside. And it's gorgeous. It's just so pretty. It never gets old. Okay, let's check out the Russian segment. Come on. Here we go. We're going through the little hatchway that takes you into the Russian segment. Inside the Russian segment, there's lots of modules as well. Down here is Mimadin. This is one of the many places where we dock vehicles. This is where Peggy actually docked. This is the this is another place where we keep a lot of our storage. It also has some of the critical systems for the Russian segment. Over here, we can go one of two directions, and it sometimes gets confusing. Let's see where we're going home. This is Meme Dubai. We have an extra spacesuit, and we have our spaceship, the beloved Argo. So you can see we have three little pigs in a blanket with our spacesuits, and then this is our actual Spuskaimi apparatus. That's what we sit in, and that's the part that we actually land in. This part actually burns up in the atmosphere. Okay, let's check out the heart and soul of the Russian segment, the service module. Obviously, the service module holds lots of critical systems for the Russian segment, but also for the space station, like our engines, to reboost and get to a higher orbit. If something's about to hit us. One of the cool things that's in the Russian segment is the Russian cosmonauts, like Fyodor, our commander. In the Russian segment, we have tons of great windows. These are really high-quality windows, so we can take pictures. We also have a lot of systems that keep the station going. And we have another uh, cargo vehicle at the very end of the station. And the last thing I'm going to show you is my favorite space picture because of what it represents. This is Yuri Gagarin with the dove because space is, pe is a peaceful exploration where we work together. If you notice, I got a Russian shirt. I got American socks. It's international. That's what this place is about, working together as one team. Woo! That's speedy time this week. Have a good day. <laughs> All right, there you go. What other questions you guys have? We're running out of yeah, we're running out of time. So I'm anybody that hasn't asked a question, I want to just double check real quick. Okay, uh, v, uh, Vira, the, v, Viraja, go ahead. Um, who uh, who do you think um, masters space exploration more, SpaceX or um, NASA? You know, uh, one of the best parts that NASA has done in recent history is called public-private partnerships. Um, so commercial cargo is what got SpaceX going. It's what made their company. Um, and so NASA is a part of SpaceX's success. Um, they've done the same thing with commercial crew, and now they're doing it with commercial lunar payload service or CLIPS. That's what our company is doing. So um, NASA, its job is to get industry going and to uh, take the next hard step so that commercial uh, space can catch up. Um, and, and the hope is you get so, so much momentum uh, towards the stars that it doesn't matter. We're all going together. Um, so I guess the answer is both. All right, kids, listen, we're going to wrap it up and so that you can all say your final goodbyes. But I get to ask one question. Um, being uh, that you were on a Russian spaceship, did you need to learn Russian? I did. Yeah, I had to become fluent and, and uh, I've forgotten a lot of it. But uh, yeah, I did press conferences in Russian and, you know, it's a Russian spacecraft, uh, spacecraft uh, uh, with a Russian commander and Russian ground uh, so you absolutely have to be fluent.
And then uh, do you get to make your uh, food choices? Like, do you, is there like a department that says, yeah, what do you want in food? And then they make it. I was kind of curious about that. Yes, ma'am. You go through a, a food lab at NASA and they give you kind of preferences and then they try to pack those and, and have them on the station. There's so many varieties as a as a military guy um, who never got to choose before on, on deployments. Um, I wasn't very picky, uh, so I was kind of like the guy who ate what was left. Um, but there definitely are some folks that are pretty picky or have, you know, tight diets and, and they, uh, they take really good care of us. Oh, interesting. Well, everybody, it's time to say goodbye. And I want to thank you all for your excitement and all your great questions. I think that was just wonderful. And so let's everybody unmute. And also uh, in the chat, I, um, I put in there uh, a documentary, which some of you maybe have never watched a documentary before, but it's called Good Night Opie. Good Night O-P-P-Y. And it's all about putting two Mars rovers on Mars and how long it took and the story. And um, I, I think it's great. And I think you all would um, enjoy it, especially if you're, uh, into understanding more about space and the future of space. So first of all, I'm going to say thank you, Jack Fisher, for your time, your talent, your sense of humor. <laughs> and uh, what a pleasure it was to have you at with all of, with, here with the, not only with all the kids, but with me. And so kids, let's, how do we say thank you? I mean, you know, just all together, uh, let's say thank you to Colonel Fisher. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for talking. Thank you. Okay, bye, great. everybody. Thank you. Bye. Keep, keep reading. Bye. Keep reading. Bye. Keep reading. Bye. Keep reading.